First of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here today, getting to talk to you about uh, our wonderful museum, the National Museum of Wildlife Art. The title of this was uh, Wildlife Art Then and Now, and I added Connections to Conservation, just to, so you would understand that I'll be connecting at some point with the main topic of this uh, conference. Um, we're the National Museum of Wildlife Art of the United States. Luckily, we're a privately funded nonprofit, so we're not shut down this week. Uh, we're open for business, and we're located in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, I think most of you probably know where that is, but I brought along a map just in case, and I tried to put it in, a ter in terms that you would all understand. Um, where are we? We are at the base, the foundation of the Yellowstone to Yukon Corridor. Um, the little red circle down there with the dot is Jackson Hole, right below Grand Teton National Park, right below Yellowstone National Park, a fantastic place. This version of the Y to Y map is one we developed with Harvey Locke uh, on a project that we did a couple of years ago that I will touch on briefly in a moment. Here's another version of where we are, one of the most beautifully scenic uh, regions in the country. This is a photograph of the Grand Tetons by Ansel Adams. And another picture of where we are, this is a painting by uh, contemporary artist Tucker Smith of the National Elk Refuge right across the street from our museum. Uh, in the wintertime, there can be five to 7,000 elk uh, grazing on the Elk Refuge right across from us. So it makes for an incredible uh, combination of our subject matter, the place in which uh, we're located, and the wildlife that surrounds us. So what do we do? I won't read the whole mission and vision to you, but we, our mission is to collect, display, interpret, and preserve the highest quality North American wildlife art su supplemented by wildlife art found throughout the world, and our main driving force is to investigate humanity's relationship with nature. Our vision is to be the significant resource for organizations and individuals interested in the connection between art and wildlife. We collect the best, the finest examples of historic and contemporary um, artists who depict wildlife, uh, particularly North America, but also we have a great European art collection. You can see in this slide a wonderful painting of a stag by Rosa Bonheur, one of France's great, great painters at the end of the 18, uh, 1800s. Uh, this is a stag she painted uh, in her estate uh, outside of Paris. So our collection ranges from art created in 2500 BC, a Native American bird stone that you can see here, to contemporary paintings. This is a painting by Barbara Castle that we just purchased last year. It's an interior still life from an apartment in New York City, and you can see there are representations of wildlife and living with wildlife in an urban environment. She has plastic animals on her table, a mobile, um, with different animals, including a peace dove. There are various references to say Noah's Ark, the olive branch, and then if you'll notice outside the window, there's a picture of the um, replacement for the World Trade Center going up in the background. So there's some great, great allegorical contemporary meanings going on in this painting that also tie to wildlife. We collect Native American baskets, contemporary glasswork. This is a piece by Jane Rosen. We collect European masters like Albrecht Durer and today's greatest wildlife artist, Bob Kuhn. Uh, this is a beautiful painting of fox chasing a snowshoe hare. We have traditional painting and sculpture. We have video installations. I had a video in this uh, presentation, but I'm not sure it's going to play. So we'll skip it. Um, so why am I here talking to you is a great question. Our collections and exhibits are inextricably tied to the concerns and issues being discussed here at Wild 10. The connections between art and science run particularly deep when looking at wildlife art. I'm going to talk a little bit, this is the art history portion of the lecture, um, about an exhibit that they're just mounting right now uh, called Darwin's Legacy, The Evolution of Wildlife Art. Uh, this exhibit examines how wildlife art has developed to incorporate an ecological vision of wildlife and habitat. 
So if you think about early wildlife art, your early European wildlife art in particular, you can roughly group it into two main categories. You have scientific illustrations on the one hand, like this picture of a, um, a deer, where you're trying to show different views of it so people can get an understanding of what it might look like. And contrasting with that are these incredible romantic renderings of battles between creatures that it didn't really matter if they could happen or not. The, more, the point was really that it was meant to draw an emotion in you, talk about the fierceness and struggle inherent in nature, and the fact that it's a lion battling a white stallion doesn't really, you know, it doesn't matter that that isn't going to happen every day on the uh, African savanna. Um, so where did wildlife artists or artists who wanted to depict wildlife go when they wanted to study for what they were doing? You might recognize the upper painting here as being Theodore Jericho's Raft of the Medusa from the Louvre. We have a beautiful Jericho painting of lions in our collection. Did he go to Africa to study lions? No. He went to the Louvre to study lions. You can see a similar pair of lions in this painting by uh, Peter Paul Rubens that's in the Marie de Medici cycle, still hanging there today. So go to the Louvre, and you can see Jericho's lions right there. Antoine-Louis Barry, the premier animalier sculptor of his era, did not travel widely. He did not go out into the wilderness. He went to the Jardin des Plantes. He went to the zoo to study wildlife. Charles Darwin had an incredible impact on the way that we perceive nature and our relationship to, our other, to the other creatures uh, living on this planet. Um, his origin of species in 1859 really changed the way, and I put many humans, but I think most of us here, changed the way we conceptualize ourselves uh, in relation to our animal bre brethren. Um, his vision of nature as a struggle for existence among a huge variety of living organisms is said to have been influenced by these romantic renderings that I showed you a moment ago. Um, and then his work, in turn, influenced artists of his time and after to focus on a fuller picture of life in the wild. Joseph Wolfe is one of the first artists to um, be really influenced by Darwin. Uh, he was born in Germany but moved to London. He worked directly with Darwin and other prominent uh, scientists and philosophers of the era. Uh, contemporary scholar Diana Donald wrote that Wolf produced the first truly ecological vision of life in the wild. What he really cared about, and this is a quote from him, he said, life, life, that's the important thing. He wanted to portray animals in the wilderness, enacting natural behaviors, and not just sort of static scientific illustrations. Um, I would love to speak with an Ibex expert, if there's one here, to know if the Langermeyer would indeed attack the Ibex on the side of a cliff. Maybe true, maybe not. Another great painting by Joseph Wolf. Again, this is a great cycle of life painting where you have falcons uh, coming down on a kite. And if you'll notice in the bottom corner, there are little rabbits running away in the background. The falcons are human controlled. So my theory is that they are um, trying to get rid of the kite so that they can have the rabbits for themselves. Um, the prejudice, uh, or the desire to go out in the wilderness and study creatures in their habitat, held on for quite some time. A famous teacher at the Berlin Art Academy, Paul Meyerheim, instructed his students when telling them um, how to paint a background for their paintings. He said, do like I do, place pieces of hard coal on the board, sprinkle sand in between, and you have the perfect desert. You don't have to go to the desert. Just do this little trick that I've envisioned for you, and uh, everything will work out fine. He told his students to go to the zoo, so this is a great painting by him of zoo lions. That way of looking at the world did not last long. Um, once the 1890s, 1900s hit, you have what we call the big four. These are four artists that changed the way that wildlife art has been created. Richard Frieza, Wilhelm Kuhnert, Karl Rungus, Bruno Lillefors. Frieza was from Germany. He's, he traveled to the Near East. He traveled to the far north, to Spitsbergen, Norway. He went to North America once with Carl Rungus, who I'll spoke about, speak about in a minute. His area of specialty was lions, tigers, and then animals that he came to know better in person. So the paintings that he's most valued for now are the animals that he saw out in the wild. Polar bears, Wiesent, 
and the red deer. And what I love is that we've seen so many great pictures of these animals today, and they remain of interest. These are paintings that were done 100 years ago, 120 years ago. They're still on our minds, these incredible animals, and we're still working with how to portray them, and we still love those images of them. Cunart claimed Africa as his primary area of, um, of specialty. He went to Africa two times, three times, uh, he went to India once, and from those travels and those studies, being in the field, seeing animals in person and watching their natural behaviors, he came back to his studio and painted wildlife as no other artist before him had painted. Tigers, beautiful elephants, wonderful lions. Going in the opposite direction from Kunert was Carl Rungus, who also um, studied with Cunart and under the influence of Frieza for some time. He chose North, North America as his main area of focus. Uh, he came to Wyoming, very close to where our museum is. He traveled to New Brunswick. He traveled to the Yukon Territory. And you can tell from his travels from Wyoming to Yukon and including Banff that Harvey Locke would be very interested and indeed is very interested in this uh, particular artist. So he specialized in these great uh, charismatic megafauna of North America got this a beautiful Wyoming elk in its environment, beautiful black bear in fall colors, and this wonderful moose in the Canadian Rockies. Bruno Lillefort is maybe the best known of these artists, especially in Europe, very influenced by the Impressionists. He sent his artwork out all over the United States, all over Europe, and he was very interested in, particularly in, say, protective coloration, which comes straight out of Darwin. So you can see this rabbit, and it blends into the colors of the canvas. He was interested in the mating displays of the caper Cayley. And he was also interested in these romantic battles. But this, you know, might actually have happened. Wildlife art today um, continues in the naturalist tradition, some of it uh, breaks with that tradition, but it can't ignore that tradition. It consciously breaks with that tradition um, to prove a point. It often incorporates a distinct conservation or political message, and a large part of our exhibit uh, schedule highlights conservation concerns, contemporary artists, and especially photographers working in this realm. Fragile Nature, Joel Sartori, Great Plains by Michael Forsberg, The Last Ocean, Antarctica's Ross Sea, photographs by John Weller. These are all exhibits that we've had. Elegy, African Wildlife by Nick Brandt will be up this winter. We have Wild Wonders of Europe right now on display in partnership with the Wild Foundation and the Murray Center. But we also do exhibits that aren't necessarily photography, but that have a conservationist bent. We showed the original illustrations from the Lorax, Andy Warhol's Endangered Species portfolio, Mark Eberhardt's On the Edge. Sometimes we do a show based on one painting and talk about how important it is. All of these birds in Mark Eberhardt's painting are on the edge of extinction. Um, and he painted this when they had thought they had found the ivory-billed woodpecker. So you can see that creature on the side. This fall, we're also, we are also mounting what we're calling a conservation gallery in which we're displaying works of art that have either very heartening or very sad uh, conservation stories. We've done some amazing collaborations recently. I've mentioned this a couple times. Yellowstone to Yukon, The Journey of Wildlife Art. Uh, we partnered with Yellowstone to Yukon, the White Museum, uh, and artist Dwayne Hardy. And you saw some film of Dwayne Hardy yesterday uh, painting in Canada. He went up and down the Yellowstone to Yukon corridor and painted amazing places um, with amazing animals. George Catlin's American Buffalo. This is an exhibit I just did with the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, and I'll be speaking about more about this exhibit and what we talked about in terms of conservation uh, on Wednesday, I think it is, in a smaller session. Uh, National Geographic photographs the great, uh, it's a long title, the greatest photographs of the American West. We partnered with National Geographic to do this amazing show that's traveling around to uh, 10 museums across the country. And then this is an example of a local program that we're a part of, but I thought it spoke volumes, especially about the kinds of things that, that, that you all have been talking about today and yesterday. There are three pillars of um, Jackson Hole and, and what it kind of means to tourists and visitors. Culture, adventure, and nature. It seems to me that you are all in a nascent stage of developing all of these things, and with 
creating spaces for wildlife, creating spaces for wild animals, you can achieve this same amazing uh, confluence of different interests. I have to finish with people because it's all about people and connecting with them. Uh, we have Carl, our mascot. We have great programs for kids. We have fancy parties where you can dress up in tuxedos. We connect with younger artists. This is Amy Ringholtz. We have bike to the museum night. We have fun runs. Sometimes we do yoga on the trail. I don't do yoga on the trail, but other people do. This is uh, one of the last slides, I promise, is um, a program called Mixed Media, which is aimed at the 20 to 40 year old audience, bringing them up for a night of art making, art viewing, food, and drink. My last question is, what can we do with you? If you have an amazing um, art conservation exhibit or program, please let me know. We'd love to partner with uh, some of our new friends that we've met here today. Thank you very much. <laughs>